Hey everyone, this is Mike Wolf, and welcome to the Spoon Podcast. It's been a little while since we dropped one, but it's that busy season of the year as we end up the year and we also get ready for CS. The Spoon is producing the CS Food Tech and Ag Tech conferences. I hope to see you in Vegas, January 9th through 12th. We will be all over the place running the conference and also writing and covering all the different food tech that we see. But today we have a great guest in Garrett Makura, who is the CEO of Pipe Dream Labs, which builds this crazy underground delivery system that seems half steampunk, half science fiction in the future, delivering food or, or whatever across town under underneath in tubes. It's a co- pretty cool concept. So we talk about that. We talk about his visits from Jeff Bezos, how he came up with that idea and all that. So it's a fun conversation. I hope you enjoy it. We'll probably get one more podcast out before then the year. Uh, it'll be a preview of what's happening at CES. All the food tech that we're seeing uh, show up there. We'll also be writing about that at the spoon so make sure you check that out as well all right that's it for now let's get to my conversation with garrett all right i'm super excited to have with us garrett makura the ceo of pipe dream we've written about you guys a couple of times you're doing this crazy underground delivery network uh that you and you guys just announced your first thing in in atlanta welcome to the show garrett thank you so much super excited to be here so I have so many questions about this this concept, man. <laughs> it's like underground delivery. Um, I bet you when you tell people about it at parties, they're going, what are you talking about? What is <laughs> yeah. this crazy concept? Yeah. How did you guys come up with this idea? Yeah, so um, I, I was a mechanical engineer growing up. Um, went, went to school of mechanical engineering, and I just like, I really went to school for mechanical engineering because I love building stuff that someone, it solves a problem so big for them that they give you money for it is like the greatest thing of all time. I just love that. And so I was like, growing up, it's like, okay, well, I need to go, you know, learn to build things if I want to like, you know, help people solve problems. Uh, Realized in school that, oh, nope, you, uh, best way to build things that solve problems and scale is uh, understanding how to put a business model around innovation. And that's actually how you scale things. And so coming out of college, I decided not to get an engineering job and um, just started building online, uh, learned to kind of scale businesses that way, um, learned to code, um, built a bunch of uh, small business SaaS products, um, but just decided to take two years off, um, went in, uh, ran biz dev at a prosthetic startup because I've always wanted to do prosthetics. It was the one thing I always wanted to do uh, with my engineering degree, ran biz dev for them. Um, and uh, during that, I just took two years and I was like, all right, I want to take two years off. And then at the end of two years, I want to start the thing that I do for the next decade, hopefully two decades of my life, no matter yep. what. Yep. And look at a lot of things and a lot of industries. And it really to us, last mile logistics was that industry that just felt like it had so much growth ahead of it. So much growth. And, and it was it's one of the only industries where it's so easy to tell where the puck is going. Um, I think with AI, it's like, I mean, you look at AI today versus seven years ago and like the engine swapped out. You know, you, you have like a core discovery that can be made that completely eradicates any work you were doing before and you kind of got to yeah, start over. Yeah. Um, with logistics, like people want things faster and cheaper and it's just so much easier um, to build towards that goalpost um, than other things, especially if you're going to take 10 years uh, to, to do it. Yeah. Um, so look at last mile logistics, there was two things we, we wanted to, um, work on is, is really, really frustrated with, um, how slow autonomous logistics was to scale. Um, and, and then kind of looking past autonomous logistics. And so we, we talked to a lot of people, um, companies, uh, utility companies, cities, um, and, and kind of like realized there were two main problems. It was, is how do you interact with the building in kind of the same way that the USPS uses a mailbox. How, how do you interact in an autonomous way, hand off, you know, um, both outgoing and incoming um, with the building and, and making sure it's it's um, the same way for a delivery driver or a drone or a self-driven car. Um, and the second one is how do you handle the longer stretches in cities um, with something that can maintain really high speeds and also be high volume um, without sacrificing safety um, and can be, you know, really adaptable to the geography it's put in, um, especially in places that are more dense and, and, you know, the cities are just built all different ways. Do you get competing ideas like drones or sidewalk robots? Yeah, yeah. I mean, drones was our first idea. Um, and I'm, I'm a huge, just personally, a huge drone guy. I've, I've done drone projects before. I, I love that space. 
It's so fun. Um, and if it, yeah, anyone who's worked with me will say like, I'm maybe I gotta be like the most optimistic drone person, um, not working at a drone company. I, I, I think there, I think people <laughs> still understate how much of an impact drones are going to have on our day to day lives. Um, yep. and uh, we were really looking at like, okay, what, you, you know, it's, it's not as much like competing. I think that's like for us is the wrong way to look at it is like, wh what is that world going to need that currently doesn't exist? And that's what we wanted to go for. Um, and so uh, looking at, okay, there needs to be, you know, really efficient um, universal exchange points um, for, for buildings, for, for interbuilding travel and apartments, um, office buildings, um, for moving around, uh, you know, high volume routes that are, are harder to get to or, or create a challenge. Um, what can kind of be that? It, we really looked at it as like, what's going to be that drone counterpart? Um, and so kind of the next thing we looked at was sidewalk robots and, and trying to find a way yep. to, to help them go faster, um, higher volume and realize like, you know, sidewalk robots are really optimized for um, what they're doing, which is, is um, finding a way through a busy place that has a lot of different delivery points and trying to ask them to solve a different problem is just so tough. It, it's so tough to get um, something that small um, yep. to safely go high speeds through a city. And so kind of like we hit a wall at that point. A lot more competition too. There's a lot more people mm -hmm. doing that. I mean, I could probably yeah. name 10 sidewalk robot companies, uh, including like the founders of Skype. <laughs> they were like the first. Starship's sick. I love Starship. Starship, yeah. Yeah, Starship's awesome. So you, you kind of looked at all the competing offerings. You wanted to make things go faster. And then ultimately at some point you decided, hey, maybe we should go underground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was during that two year period where we were just like, okay, and the goal was like take two years and through two years it means you don't like end up at a local maxima to use kind of like the um uh ai analogies like you, you don't want to end up in somewhere you're like okay this is good you really want to dig deep and so taking that two years was ultimately really helpful um because it's like okay let's just explore all ideas and so we asked ourselves like what do cities already do to handle mass distribution issues um and we were like, okay, they go above ground wire, buried wire, um, or underground pipe. And that was where we were like, okay, ridiculous, um, regulatory nightmare, cost uh, through the roof, um, but let's just go diligence it. We we're diligencing everything. And as we started to dig into it, we realized, oh, you know, there are really interesting economies of scale already created to put in underground infrastructure, both from the materials, the construction knowledge, the tools, uh, regulatory, like there's just really, I mean, we, we have these vast delivery networks in cities. Um, the difference is, is like most of those delivery networks are just designed to move poop efficiently through a city. Yeah. Um, yeah. which is like kind of, kind of crazy, like how, how vast that infrastructure is. Um, and you know, there's, there's regulatory on how to, to interface those, those, uh, pipes with the building, um, how to go into roads through all, all different types of right of way. Um, and, and once we realized that, we really looked and said, okay, is there a way to, off the back of all that innovation and, and knowledge, um, use that same infrastructure uh, to build out logistics networks? Um, and it was through that uh, diligence that we realized, like, oh, there, there really is. There really is a, a – um, um, that seems to be the missing um, piece for citywide scale autonomous um, delivery. And then ultimately, you know, our, our goal was, you know, we want to make autonomous deliveries happen as quickly as possible and then look for like past autonomous delivery and say, what, once you have that, what comes next? You know, kind of like once you have the Internet, what changes about right. data? Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's ultimately when we started the company was we realized that there's this thing after autonomous logistics um, that there wasn't a name for it before. We, we call it hyper logistics now, um, where once you have. Uh, the ability to have something delivered in under 10 minutes for, um, we always say a nominal fee, something you don't think about, um, call it a quarter. Um, if you can also turn every delivery point into a sending point, so you have this really easy ability to send back through the supply chain, um, you end up in this really interesting world of commerce where you kind of flip commerce on its head and it becomes less about um, you know, making things cheap enough that it's cheap enough for someone to buy them and store them in her house for the one to two times a year they actually need it and then they go find yeah. it, they grab it and use it. You get to a place where instead people um, just, you know, go, hey, Amazon Assistant, uh, 
send me a screwdriver. They know it's going to be there in under five minutes. They use a the screwdriver. They put it in the magical drawer in their kitchen. They send it back. Um, and that's, they, they have, instead of spending all this money to get these, you know, really cheaply made tools and have them sitting in the garage all the time and all the, you know, resources we world's resources we've put into making sure that there's 10, 15 billion screwdrivers, um, however many there are allocated all over the world, um, you, you start to, you know, the, start to interact with objects the same way we interact with, with data online now, which is much more about uh, quick access to library of content, uh, library of contents rather than, um, you know, what we used to do kind of with movies on the internet in the early days where you'd go and buy it on iTunes. You're trying to create the Netflix of things is, is what you're saying. Yeah. That's really interesting. Let's take a step back and for the listener, explain what you're building, right? So it's a underground tube. You had a really cool video. It's the first time I saw it in action when you guys, I think, kind of announced last week your first pilot in Atlanta. And it looked to me like a little, I see the engineer and you like probably just having so much fun building this thing. It's like this cool little autonomous train on a little t- train track going through tubes. You could probably explain it better. Talk, tell people what you built. Yeah, yeah. So it's a modular system uh, of a few parts um, that just make it easy uh, to build out um uh, connection between one place and another. Um, so from point A to point B, um, the, the above ground systems are called portals. Um, so they're how you inter- interact, whether that's a, a drawer and a wall, um, like we have in, in the Atlanta network, um, or a standalone kiosk in a parking lot or in a city, um, or, um, a high volume portal in, in the back of a retail store, like we have in Atlanta. Um, and then the, uh, what makes it work is, uh, it's really, it really does trend. It, you know, it didn't start that way. Um, it didn't start looking like a train, but really now it, it really looks like kind of a shipyard. And I, I think it's interesting how um, when you try to make things as simple and as efficient as possible, they kind of mirror each other. Um, but we have, you know, the the up and down units, the cranes that move uh, modular blocks of things. You know, shipyards use um, dumb kind of dumb waiters. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shipyards use the um, uh, the containers, and, and we use totes. Um, but we, that's what moves them up and down and into storage, and then you you drop those into uh, trains. Um, so it's it is it does look like a little train on rails. Um, and uh, just through that, you know, you can you can build out um, you know small systems that go from the back of the house in a retail store or back of the house of a fast food restaurant and, and deliver to. Um, portals through a parking lot, um, or you can build uh, citywide systems um, that move things much larger distances. And, and uh, you know, it started off as like I, I think the prototype is oh, it's back there. It's not in frame. Um, it's so cool. The first one was so cool, and there were like a million things on it that were like, oh, look at this great little innovation thing we came up with here. It's like so elegant how it works. And uh, Canon, our CTO, he is, uh, for my money, he never say this. He's like, I think he's a top five modular roboticist in the world. I think he's phenomenal. He sold his last company, Modular Robotics, um, to Sphero, uh, the company that made BB-8. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did he sell to, did he sell to Sphero or did, would he, was he part of the Sphero team? He sold, he sold his company to, to Sphero. Okay. Um, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And, and he, he, he's just so good at um, uh, building things that work. And, and being okay um, with, I, I think a lot of times engineers fall into traps where they want to build the cool thing, not the good thing. And Kenan always says, a, a, a good robot, is, you know you have a good robot when people stop calling it a robot and they stop thinking it's cool. <laughs> and, yep, yep. and so over the past, like systems, versions of the system, just like beating out complexity, beating out, um, and you know, when you're building underground systems, you can't have them break. They, they need to have, um, you know, really high reliability and then also um, a really small amount of things that can break and really easy solutions um, to, uh, you know, not necessarily fix them, but they just need to be able to, to be moved out of the way. Um, it looks to me like it's running on a, a rail. Um, it's interesting. I think it was today or yesterday that Elon Musk announced he's shutting down Hyperloop. Originally, I wondered if it, like, it was going to be like a Hyperloop. So is it essentially a one-way track or like a track that you're just going back and forth on or is it a loop? Yeah. So, um, you know, it really depends on the system and the system needs. If you think about this, I mean, unfortunately, like trains are a great way to think about it. If you think about building train tracks, depending on volume, sometimes the cheapest thing to build is point to point one way and then, and then bounce everything back and forth. 
Um, sometimes it's building in a loop. Um, other times you think about like a subway, it's, it's, it's building two on top of each other. It, it really depends on the needs of the system, um, how you build that out. Um, but our, our guiding light is just, we want to reduce the cost per linear foot of installing the network. That ultimately is pretty much the only cost of the system ever. Everything post that is electricity and maintenance. Um, so our, our guiding light, and you can see it in the product, it's like the, the difference between this and Hyperloop is we have been so focused on nothing smart, nothing moving, um, nothing motorized in the, in the uh, uh, static infrastructure. Um, so, so the pipe and the rail, that needs to be as dumb and as simple and as cheap and easy to manufacture as possible. Um, and put all the intelligence and, and all the complexity into the, into the robot itself. Um, that way it's just the, the easiest and cheapest to, to build out larger systems. So the Atlanta one you built out, the pilot, is it, it's a single track that you're going back and forth on. And what is the time from one point to the other? So I'm just kind of wondering what the, how much you can deliver in, in say, a given hour. I, I don't know what's currently, because it's our test place, so it, 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 the, the speeds kind of fluctuate. It's also like the, is the first version of the new architecture. Um, so I tell people it's kind of like SpaceX uh, Grasshopper. It's like a bare bones, very simple. Uh, a lot of the stuff kind of, you know, our, our new stuff resembles that um, in, in the way that it moves, but not in the way that it looks. Um, so that, that's really like our place just to just kind of test stuff in the real world, mostly stuff of, around uh, environment. Um, so, um, you know, all the little things that come with being underground, um, you know, kind of forcing ourselves to, to learn by, by existing. What is the speed at, like from point A to point B? I think it's like about almost a mile or less than a mile, but how fast does it get from point A to point B? I think it's usually like three minutes, um, okay. from point A to point B. So it's a little slower than, than the, the main system, but, um, uh, I think I, I'm gonna have to double check that number, but I think I think it's about three minutes. It's so interesting to me when I thought about what you guys are building. It seemed like it would be great in greenfield types of environments, right? So hey, we're putting in a master plan community, mm-hmm. and it seems like you the, the the business park you went into maybe is something like that, but also you you wanted to also ride on existing infrastructure. So talk about that. That let's let's go where there's nothing built they're building a new mastermind community makes sense versus, Hey, let's go underground in a busy city. Um, are you looking to yeah. do both? And what are the differences in, in terms of difficulties? Yeah. I mean, we're, ultimately you, you, it's kind of, it's kind of, if you can do one, you can do the other. If you can do retrofit, you can do greenfield. And so we kind of looked at it and, you know, journey's out if this is the right call. I think it was. Um, but uh, the, what we decided ultimately was, there, the level of complexity for doing brand new greenfield is maybe an order of magnitude less than retrofitting. And right. it forces different things about the engineering and it forces, um, uh, it, it is like maybe an order, order of magnitude less uh, learnings than, than doing retrofit. And so for us, for our first one, we wanted to make sure that we are building the right system for the hardest possible thing we would do. Um, so the Atlanta network, the, the reason we loved it is, uh, it is everything in that city is built. So we, we didn't, everything we went in was retrofit, uh, through the city was retrofit. Um, we put in all new infrastructure. We got permits like we would anywhere else in the city. Um, it is extremely wet. It's rains so much there. So it's, it's, you know, um, making sure we're resilient against water. It's extremely windy and it changes elevation a ton. It's very hilly. So the, the you're going through something that's like this. It's not like one straight thing. It's multiple yeah, yeah. turns. And in between the turns are just like watching it go. You're, it's, it's always doing this. Um, so that's why we loved it is, is it really forced us to um, make sure our system was really good at being retrofit. Um, and I think, you know, when, as we've uh, brought customers there, I, I think they've really appreciated that. Um, just being able to, to look and say, you know, this city was built and it's under there and you can't even tell. It, it's just like, it's invisible. It, it's, um, I, I think it says a lot. Because uh, it, it's one of those things where you, you would think you bring someone there and they'd be like, whoa, this is so cool. It's like, so whoa, it's like very, uh, I'm really impressed. And people come away being like, oh, it's so normal. It's just like, it, it's kind of like, it's weird it hasn't existed before. 
Um, it's just like this really normal thing. And, and that's the best for us. It's like, that's, that's the win is, is people come away seeing how normal and, and simple it is to install. People are probably wondering why underground? Why not? I mean, we, we talked a little bit about the difficulty of, of sidewalk robots. Drones are easy, but I think you guys have talked about other benefits, right? I think one of the things that makes sense to me is like, it's obviously going to reduce clutter on sidewalks. It's going to reduce, take stuff off streets, but also it's not going to emit a bunch of CO2 into the atmosphere, right? So like, what are some of the, the selling points when you're talking to cities or municipalities? Yeah, I think it's just volume. Uh, I mean, those other, those other things are in, in, in the autonomous logistics, that those are more benefits of autonomous logistics as a whole. Um, you know, they're, they're, um, I even think self-driving cars, just the, the amount of density self-driving cars can hold, um, I think will also reduce congestion and, and uh, drones and self-driving cars, they, they uh, are sidewalk robots, they all push um, less emissions, they all push less congestion. Um, and I, I think ultimately, I, I, I think it's, there's orders of magnitudes that people always m misunderstand. Like as we move to email, as we move to the internet, as we move to e-commerce, everyone's always like, okay, it's maybe, maybe some transitions, some of current volume transitions to this new space. That makes sense. Maybe the optimists are like, it all moves over there. But very few people realize that it's, it's usually a, a, that, that little reduction in friction creates 10x more total volume uh, than was happening before. Um, and I, I think it's something that people, it may, it may, I could be wrong, but, but I, I hold a lot of conviction that as we reduce the cost of delivery in a city and, and the, the, the time, the explosion of the amount of deliveries a city is handling uh, is going to dramatically increase. And so being able to you know, hold that volume on the edge of a city in warehouses and be able to really quickly stream them into the city, um, closer to where, where people are, and then hand off to a drone and, and have the drone make that that last mile, two mile run um, into the end user's home. Um, I, I think there's a lot of, uh, the, the volume is gonna be a secondary effect that um, if we don't solve now, it is gonna hold back autonomous delivery from really scaling. I think I've seen your CTO tweet or maybe you tweet about different use case scenarios and different uh, user modalities. I think you even had demoed an idea around like a, a receptacle in a home. Like you actually pull mm -hmm. open, you're yeah. in a home, you pull it open and there's your delivery. I would imagine you're going to do kind of mid mile stuff first, kind of big volume through into like hubbers, commerce hubs. But do you see this eventually going into homes? Yeah, I, I think what going into homes means is going to be really different. Um, I think some, sometimes people like, I think there's always like, there, there's just like this, this um, there's three parts to understanding what we're doing. The first part is thinking it's like totally impossible, which I totally get. And uh, that's where I was originally, right? It's like totally impossible, never work. Um, like it'll never happen once. And, and then you realize like, oh, it's actually a lot easier to do this than before. This is going to be everything will be this every single thing is gonna be run through pipes. And then it's, you kind of move to the third one where it's like, oh man, last mile logistics is super hard. Um, it is, cities are built so many different ways. Buildings are built so many different ways. Um, it's gonna be a mix of a lot of different modalities that ultimately make city scale autonomous delivery work. And there's gonna to need to be a lot of approaches um, to, to kind of you know bring cities online and buildings online and um, you know, residential and office and warehouse. Uh, so I, I, I think it will be very long before you kind of get a pipe to pipe, full end uh, delivery from a warehouse to a user's home. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be that long before, um, you know, an Amazon delivery touches a few modalities to get to an end user and it does get delivered into their home. Um, I think, you know, there needs to be this new mailbox for, for autonomous delivery, um, something that can be secure, um, delivered to a home, and then ultimately be able to make that handoff back to, to the autonomous modality. Um, so that's what we're really focused on. I, I think, you know, if you look at mailboxes, mailboxes exist in so many different ways. Uh, the way that a mailbox works in an apartment building is categorically different than how a mailbox works in residential. And they... Um, are delivered differently, and they kind of the the truck the mailman uses, or is he on foot? Yeah, yeah, is, going, yeah. is he on a bike? Um, and I think like 
yes, I really think we can get down to this really simple architecture that can be put in a bunch of different places, but ultimately the way it's put in is going to be really different. I have to ask you about this because I wrote a story about it. I, I think uh, one of you guys tweeted about, uh, I don't know, maybe the richest man on earth dropping by to take a look at your <laughs> thing. Jeff Bezos was checking out one of your demos. Tell us about that and what did he think? Um, yeah, it was that that was like the craziest thing that's ever happened to us. It was um, what I'll say about it is it, it was um, he puts on this really great tech summit every year in California. Um, and yeah, I to this day don't know how or why we were invited. Um, but it was it was one of one of it was just we loved it. I, I am anyone knows. I am the biggest Jeff Bezos stan of all time. I <laughs> just the way and I, I like I love I I was mentioning this to someone there. I was like, man, come on, like this is one of the best business minds ever, maybe. And one of the simplest thinkers. And not not to interrupt you, but we have to mention yeah. is Amazon has actually filed patents for underground delivery. And I think we talked about this a little bit before in the pre-show. It was a conveyor belt system, but they did file patents, so they were so I wondered in my piece, is Amazon thinking about this? <laughs> so it's like, it made you kind of wonder. So, but it's a different system from what you guys built. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that was um, what they put in the, the patents was different than what they were thinking. They were, you know, I think they're good at filing patents. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, media training's kicking in here a little bit. Uh <laughs> So I won't say too much, but Bezos was looking at it, which is pretty yeah. cool. So you guys were at his tech summit, kind of showing off this crazy concept, and people were kind of checking it out. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it was great. It was like, um, yeah, that it's, it's a, um, I don't, yeah. I think they're a little private about it, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great, really, really cool event of of a bunch of um, uh, academics and scientists and uh, industry people and, and the the leadership team at Amazon um, and just like for me I'm just like the, I'm the biggest Amazon nerd I know I know their company backwards and forwards um, it's just so great to be in that environment and um, just be uh, it's just the way they think about uh, business and growth and um, how to pick a big problem like I, I love you know Jeff Bezos has a, a great saying about picking a big problem you want to pick something where you, um, he says it a little differently, but it's like where you know what the customer wants. And for you know uh, them with AWS and e-commerce, it's it, it, people are always going to want things cheaper and faster. They're always going to want cloud that's easier to access and um, scalable and cheap. Um, and just the way you think they think about yep. just business and logistics. I mean, they're the I mean, they're, they crush logistics. They created a whole yep. new kind of logistics. Um, I mean, they're they're the best, and just, it was it was great to just like be there and people who think big and and big about logistics and and learned a lot um, uh, about you know what they think. So you guys have your first pilot running in the suburbs of Atlanta. You're learning a lot. It's actually working. So people are probably imagining ordering stuff. And so what's next for you? Are you guys looking to just take learnings from this? Do you have your next big pilot planned? Yeah, yeah. So you know we're we're looking at. Um, uh, deciding this year on on where um, our first two city wide systems are going to be, um, and then start work on that next year, um, with the goal of of either ending or starting construction next year. Um, and so we think we know where they're going to be, um, but but still looking a little bit, um, and then also just really scaling uh, our first inch product, which is um, uh, going from back of house to. Uh, curbside uh, it's automated curbside um, we call it instant pickup um, but piloting that with uh, a bunch of brands in Q1 and then um, working on scaling it through the rest of the year you guys also announced or I think the the, the fast food chain announced I can't remember if it was Jack in the Box or, or whatever Burger it was King, Win but Wendy's you guys announced are, it Wendy's I apologize to yeah. Wendy's um, <laughs> you guys are actually and by the way, there's been lots of innovation in drive through right? There's, mm -hmm. I think it was, um, maybe it's KFC or whatever, but they were doing basically um, a, a dumb waiter. So they were basically stacking their drive through yeah. and having multiple places to go. This kind of reminded me of that, but instead of going overhead and dropping down, it's going underneath. So it was a pretty cool concept. So you are working with them to basically build a mini version of this underground system. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the, the great thing is it's, it's, you know, it's all the same system. It's the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, you know, because we've created kind of, um, you know, when you're going citywide, you got to make it cheap. You got to make it so cheap. And uh, we made it so cheap that it, it's really cheap to put into uh, existing building. Um, and it's really easy just the way that parking lots are permitted and uh, how construction happens in parking lots. You know, it's a, a three-day process to install it. Um, you don't have to shut down the restaurant. Um, you keep it open. And it, it's a process that I would bet everyone listening to this podcast has seen that process happen before and don't even notice it. Um, it's called Cut and Cover. Um, and uh, if you've ever driven over one of those big metal planks, um, it's because there was a project going on underneath that night. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, that's been a, a, a really good product for us. Um, it's uh, something that, you know, we, we always said we wanted to impact logistics now, tomorrow, and in the future. Um, and if we couldn't impact logistics now, then you know, we're just a, a people with a pipe dream. Um, I mean, and fast, fast food drive throughs are choke points, right? It's mm -hmm. a choke point in a logistics network that is like a really short one. But like the classic drive through, like you have the 10 cars in line at rush hour. But if you can have like five pickup points, people put their order in digitally and you're shipping them to each little pickup point, it, you can just really expedite. So I can see that being a much more immediate impact than, I mean, it'll just happen quicker than when your, your citywide systems. Right? Oh, way quicker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, way quicker. I mean, the citywide is, you know, it's the white whale. Yeah. It's, it's um, but uh, it's going to take a lot longer. Pick, pick up is something that we've really been focused this year. Um, you know, we, we kind of do everything. Uh, we we kind of do everything and then talk about it six months later. So Peachtree is a great example of that is, you know, it's an older system and, and we, just, we talk about it much later than it, than it happened. Um, first Inch is the same thing. We've been working a ton on First Inch. Um, some super interesting um, um, partners that we were very lucky um, to work with, both, both on the restaurant and the grocery side. Um, and yeah, so... Define, define First Inch for us. Yeah, so, so First Inch is that uh, autonomous... Um, uh, if you think about the... the, the uh, uh, supply chain as a whole, you have yeah. first inch, middle mile, last inch. So, so how does yeah. something get in and out of the building? How's it go a little longer distance in between, and then in and out of the, the where it's going at the end? Um, and first inch is it focuses on that first part. Um, how do you effectively um, get something uh, really quickly uh, to the person it's supposed to go to in a way that's autonomous? And, and autonomous yeah. curbside is a really fast growing product for um, uh, a lot of companies, and is is in, in some cases, the fastest growing ways that, that consumers want to interact with restaurants and stores. Um, but it's just so complicated and labor intensive. Um, and the wait times are, are often longer than just going through the drive through anyways. Um, and so for us to, to create an experience. Do you see yourself competing with pickup lockers? I mean, in a, in a sense, that's another way to expedite that last or the first inch as you, as you call it. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, we, our goal is to um, um, be in places that are more high volume. So a place where a drive through either would make sense or um, somewhere a drive through would be. And there's a lot of places a drive through would be but couldn't be. Um, grocery is a great example of that. Ideally, like, grocery would have a drive through It would be awesome. Um, but just the volumes are, are so much different. You kind of see that in, in pharmacy. Um, drive through is where oftentimes just the wait time and drive through just around it your gets rid of all the convenience it would have otherwise given you. Um, and pickup lockers are great because they can go anywhere. They're super cheap to put in. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter kind of when, when people come pick it up. Like it can go like really interesting places. Um, so I don't say competing, but but ultimately, you know, there, there's a couple of things we're thinking about, especially in Europe where um, pickup lockers are a lot more prevalent. They're, they're, you know, one of the leading ways that people interact with e-commerce. Um, looking at, at ways we can stream things into pickup lockers um, in Europe, that's really tunnel forward, really infrastructure forward, um, which, is, which is weird because you would think it'd be the opposite. I think originally we were like, okay, Europe feels like it's going to be regulata regulatory, way heavier. Um, they're not going to want to put things on the ground. It's actually the from our experience so far, the opposite. They're um, hmm. looking to put more underground infrastructure in. Uh, they want they want to, um, you know, I think they have a much different, uh, Americans have a much different take on infrastructure. We're more thinking about 30 years, and Europe's yeah. thinking about, you know, a couple hundred years. They've just been around longer. 
Um, and America's America's like almost a bunch of different countries. I imagine it's maybe different in Texas versus California, right? It probably varies quite a bit. But I do have a question about payload size. One of the things is at least looking at your Peachtree Atlanta deployment. I mean, it's a pretty nice payload. I mean, you could get a, like, a big a lunch for like three or four people or dinner. But when you said groceries, I'm thinking, man, I don't see a bag of groceries going underneath. Are you looking at different payload sizes? Like say in that last inch where you want to do a couple bags of groceries? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we're um, the, the we're look, without saying too much, yeah, the, the compatibility where, you know, um, Ken's always good about making sure we maintain uh, compatibility so that if we build out, you know, what is a, effectively a protocol, we're staying consistent. Um, but yeah, we have a, if you give me two seconds, let me grab, I've got a ton of, can always make sure we have a ton of totes lying around. Um, but for grocery and e-commerce, um, you know, there's, there's a much more standard. Oh, wow. That's, that's a big, that's a pretty big tote size. Yeah. So that you're building the big, the jumbo size for the last inch, uh, for that curbside grocery pickup. Yeah. And, and, um, most likely, um, for, for the larger system as well. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's not a bunch of modifications that need to happen in order to, to, um, change sizes. Um, and things can still be backwards compatible. So, um, we kind of always had that in the back of our heads, um, that this was, you know, as you guys are building it like Rivian, right? You can, you can put a bunch of different si- things on top of the same essential infrastructure. Yeah, I mean Rivians, they're they're the best at it. But uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully someday like them. Yeah, you guys are the Rivian of underground delivery, is what you're saying. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, you can have it. No one else is claiming it. I mean, you guys are the only one that I know of is doing it. Is there anyone one else in the space? Do you kind of have it to yourself right now? No, I mean there's 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 a lot of people. I, you know, I kind of think of of competitors. You know, um, both underground and. Uh, uh, autonomous logistics as a whole. I mean, it, not even competitors. I think it's like, um, uh, you know, there's a, a, a company here in Austin um, called Tubular Network uh, that is um, doing this for, for warehouse, like inter-warehouse travel. Um, they're really cool. Um, and like, we get dinner once a month where it like, I, I love them. Um, we, we have a lot of information sharing. Um, you know, I think everyone kind of views this as there's not competitors yet. There will be someday. Um, but right now, it's it's going to take all of us to, to – and I think way more. And my biggest thing is we need way more people in the space, um, not less. Uh, I, I think there's too many people working on AI and AI products. And I wish some of those founders would look towards logistics and, and realize that getting into last mile logistics now is what getting into AI would have been 2019. It's right on the precipice of this big boom, and it's the perfect time to, to find a problem. And that problem is going to be way bigger than you could ever imagine. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think you know we won't have the space to ourselves forever. I think we've carved out a, a nice um, uh, space for ourselves, and, and I hope I hope we don't have it to ourselves forever. Um, but uh, yeah, I think. Uh, um, Right, right now it's yeah we, we've got it we've got that uh, niche to ourselves a little bit. Well, cool. Well, your city will be the uh, underground delivery uh, mecca <laughs> if you guys keep building <laughs> and your neighbors build it. But this has uh, been a fun conversation, Garrett. Um, people can find out more at Pipe Dream Labs. Yes, sir. Pipe Dream Labs. Co. Co. All right, Pipe Dream Labs. Co. Check it out. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for spending time with me. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mike. This has been awesome. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. I learned a lot. It's a pretty cool concept. I would encourage you to check out their website. Also look for them and check out our articles on the spoon. We have the video of their underground delivery system in action. So it's pretty fun to check out. All right, folks, stay tuned. We'll be back in just a little bit with our preview of CS. Otherwise, enjoy the holidays.